Um, without further ado, let me introduce Natalie Paquette at, from the IAS. She will be talking this week about Borchard's Ketz Moody algebras, 2D strings, and other curiosities. Take it away. Thanks a lot, Tudor. Um, so first, let me start by thanking the organizers uh, for the invitation to speak. I've really been enjoying this, um, this colloquium series as an attendee, so I'm uh, very honored to be able to participate now as a speaker as well. Oh. There we go. So this talk is based on a series of related works, um, all of which have been done in collaboration with my uh, heroic collaborator, Roberto Valpato, uh, from whom I've learned a great deal and have collaborated on, uh, with him on other works that are not just uh, not listed here, but have helped inform my thinking on this subject as well. And today I'll focus on a particular set of works that was also done in collaboration with Daniel Person and Sarah Harrison, as you can see in various linear combinations. And the most recent entry appeared on the archive last week. And um, we'll have one coming up, hopefully soon, perhaps this month, but at least in the near future. Uh, so the underlying motivation for all of the studies that I'm going to tell you about today is to attempt to clarify some connections um, between various distinguished mathematical structures that all seem to be playing a role uh, in string theory. Um, so here is a laundry list of some of the interesting mathematical structures that seem to be cropping up in various special corners of physics and related to one another with string theory as sort of the mediating or guiding mechanism that connects these things. And we'd like to try and understand some of these relationships and then uh, hopefully use our a novel understanding of these mathematical structures and ask what the ramifications are for the physics and what we can learn uh, from, from these structures that are in play. So um, I am a physicist and this will be mostly a physics talk, but I do hope that there will be something for everyone in this talk. Um, but let me begin by trying to synthesize my perspective on the subject, which um, is uh, a, really a physical summary. Um, and I hope the mathematicians will just bear with me through, through this part of, of the uh, introduction. So if I had to synthesize the broad lessons from the various studies that, that we've been undertaking, I would say something like this. Um, it's instructive to study string compactifications down to a relatively low number of non-compact dimensions, say three or fewer. And in this talk, we'll mostly focus on actually on two non-compact dimensions. And the reason for doing this is to try and find uh, phases of string theory that enjoy symmetry enhancements. So it's kind of analogously to how physicists often like to study the tensionless limit of string theory and uh, discover large unbroken groups of gauge symmetries there. Low dimensional compactifications are a different kind of setting in physics where um, in particular the dualities can enhance quite a lot as we compactify down to lower and lower dimensions. So although the physics in lower dimensions can be a little bit curious and perhaps less clear than in four, dimen four non-compact dimensions and higher, nonetheless, it seems like these are nice structures for starting to get a handle on some formal elements of the theory. So we have these large duality groups that are in play in very low dimensions. And I'll be focusing only on super string compactifications for this talk. And whenever we have supersymmetry, we can study, for example, BPS saturated quantities in these low dimensional string compactifications. So of course the prototypical BPS saturated quantity is something like an index that counts uh, roughly speaking such BPS states. But in lower dimensions, you also might prefer to think of a BPS saturated quantity, perhaps something like um, a term in the low energy effective action or a threshold correction that's BPS saturated. But these physical observables, these special uh, tractable physical observables, which we can often compute, are necessarily invariant under these groups of, of dualities. And the mathematical uh, avatar of this duality invariance is that BPS saturated uh, quantities can produce nice modular or automorphic objects. So the basic players in the talk today in low dimensions are going to be automorphic forms on string theory moduli spaces. Um, and as I said, we have these large duality groups of symmetries. And so um, in these theories, there are a different number of duality frames that admit a nice perturbative description and we can study them quite explicitly. And going to the points in moduli space where we have these complementary perturbative descriptions um, amounts to expanding the automorphic form around certain cusps in moduli spaces. And um, 
Often what we find, at least in the examples that we're focusing on in today's talk, is that the expansions of these automorphic forms and these different perturbative duality frames actually uh, are very nice representation theoretic functions. And in particular, they can be denominators of Borchardt's cats moody algebras. So Borchardt's cats moody algebras will be kind of the workhorses for today's talk. Um, so for example, one of my favorite automorphic forms is called phi 12. And it's uh, a form with respect to the orthogonal group uh, on the even unimodular lattice of signature 2 comma 26. Uh, so this automorphic form is naturally defined on a moduli space, which you can view as a quotient space um, based on the orthogonal group uh, of signature 226, quotiented by this arithmetic subgroup. And phi 12, as it happens, actually admits 24 nice models for this function. So it arises from taking this lattice and splitting it up into two copies of the even unimodular lattices of signature 1, 1. And then you have a choice of one of the four Niemeyer lattices, including the Leech lattice, which are the positive definite even unimodular lattices of rank 24. Um, so from this lattice decomposition, uh, this automorphic form phi 12, which is defined on a nice moduli space, has 24 nice product representations, where uh, these exponents are based on lattice theta functions of the corresponding Niemeyer lattice. So this automorphic form itself is actually the denominator of a big infinite dimensional algebra called the fake monster. And if we expand it around these different cusps, these 24 Niemeyer cusps, we obtain denominators of 24 different affine Lie algebras. So formally, all this mathematical structure was explicated in a paper by Gritsenko, and um, my collaborators and I began to partially uh, explain the appearance of this function in a low dimensional string compactification. Um, but this uh, example, I think physically is still a little bit more mysterious, so it won't be the example that I'm focusing on today. Um, it's just to give kind of a flavor, give a concrete example of the kinds of structures that I'm going to be playing with. So I can sum up that part of what I wanted to say by saying, okay, we compactify down to low dimensions. We exhibit these beautiful mathematical structures. We understand something about the automorphic forms on these moduli spaces. And then what you would like to do is to start to progressively decompactify your theory um, and see what happens. So as I said, low dimensions are useful for understanding some of the formal properties of these theories, but physically they're not the most natural uh, playgrounds uh, in string theory that we understand well. But if you imagine that we're studying low dimensional compactification, say um, on a torus, for example, you can start to uh, take the radii of some of the circles that comprise the torus to be very, very large and gradually grow up to um, more and more non-compact directions and try to track how the, uh, the du duality symmetry that was so huge in low dimensions breaks in these progressive decompactification limits and try to organize some of the symmetries of string theory in that way. Um, and decompactification limits in moduli space, uh, again, from the point of view of the automorphic forms, will tell you something about their analytic behavior as you go to certain uh, cusps in the moduli space. Um, and that's a, an interesting playground as well. And we explored some, some of these symmetry breaking ideas in work that I won't talk about today, but this is the physical context uh, that I want you to have in the back of your mind. Let's see. So for the rest of the talk today, um, I'll be trying to illustrate this ethos in some concrete and particularly simple examples where we can really understand the mathematical structures in a bit more detail and make precise the connections between uh, to Borchardt's Katz Moody algebras in these string compactifications. So um, we'll have some super string theory in 10 dimensions. We'll be compactifying down to two dimensions, as I said. Um, and depending on the quantity I want to compute or uh, exactly what, what I want to study in these low dimensions, I might consider two, the two dimensions to be non-compact, or I might remain in Lorentzian signature and study the theory on a cylinder where the spatial direction is compactified on a circle of radius r, or I might wish to pass to Euclidean signature and compute the path integral uh, on a Euclidean torus. But all of the examples that I'll be focusing on today are particularly special examples of string compactifications. Um, so they have this funny factorized form that I've written here. So, so what do I mean by that? Well, the prototypical string compactification that we're all used to is taking our uh, internal world sheet theory, say, to be a sigma model with target some geometric space. And um, if you think of the fields in the theory classically as parametrizing the coordinates of your geometric space, um, say if it's a complex manifold, you'll have a, you know holomorphic and anti-holomorphic coordinates, and you can't split them up nicely. 
There may be special points in a geometric compactification in the moduli space where um, the internal theory factorizes into holomorphic and anti-holomorphic pieces, and those are also interesting. But more, um, more concretely for the purposes of today's talk, I'm going to be considering internal compactification or world sheet theories that are formed from a product of two vertex operator algebras or a vertex operator super algebras, one holomorphic that I'm calling V and the other anti-holomorphic that I'm calling W. And although this largely won't be a moonshine talk, some moonshine modules, which are nice VOAs or super VOAs, will furnish particularly nice examples of these kinds of, in, uh, of these uh, string theories that I want to start playing with. Uh, for example, the canon one of the canonical examples of a vertex operator algebra is the monster module, and it will be one of our starring examples in this talk, and so I'll say a little bit about moonshine um, to get us all oriented and on the same page. And I think since 2020 has felt to many of us like Ragnarok, uh, the role of the monster or the monster module in this talk will be played by Jormungandr, the world serpent. Um, of course, when you give a talk on monstrous moonshine or if the monster module appears, you have to choose your favorite monster to represent, uh, to represent the monster module whenever it appears. Uh, good. So, the plan, that, that concludes the, the very uh, physics-y overview of what I want to say. And the plan for the rest of the talk is going to be as follows. So I'll be focusing on the appearance of uh, Borchard's cats moody algebras in certain low dimensional string compactifications. Um, I'm going to abbreviate that to BKM just so I don't have to keep saying Borchard's cats moody algebras over and over again for this talk. But as I mentioned uh, in the beginning of the talk, we're motivated by many other considerations and many other connections to mathematics. And indeed, there are interesting connections with moonshine that one can start to draw. I'll largely de-emphasize them in this talk. Uh, feel free to ask me afterwards. Um, but you can just take some of the moonshine modules as nice examples for what I'm going to be telling you about. And there are other nice examples that have nothing to do with moonshine. So well, what we're going to do next is to introduce Borchardt's cats moody algebras, what they are, and we'll largely do so in the context of uh, historically the most important Borchardt's cats moody algebra, the monster Lie algebra. So we'll review uh, what that algebra looks like and how it appeared historically. Uh, then I'll explain how my collaborators and I produce some new examples of Borchardt's cats moody super algebras, which follows groundwork in, in proofs laid down by Scheitauer, who constructed the first uh, supersymmetric example. Then um, after we discuss Borchardt's cats moody algebras and super algebras, I'll go back to the physics perspective that I just uh, summarized, and I'll explain how to embed or how Borchardt's cats moody algebras can naturally arise in certain low dimensional string compactifications. So I'll uh, talk about a particular example where the monster Lie algebra will reappear and play a role in some interesting physical systems. And I'll mention um, other low dimensional compactifications that will also um, implicate the BKM super algebras that we construct uh, in the earlier part of the talk. And as usual, I will conclude with uh, wild speculations. Okay, so now to the introductory part of the talk, uh, to the more technical part. So um, Borchardt's cats moody algebras, as I mentioned, well, of course they were defined and constructed by Borchardt's originally, and he introduced these structures in the context of proving the monstrous moonshine conjectures. So even though I don't want to dwell on uh, the details of monstrous moonshine, I have to tell you a little bit to give you the context in which these structures arise and to establish some no useful notation and concepts that will appear in the rest of the talk. So here is the uh, one slide obligatory review of monstrous moonshine to get us all on the same page and to get us primed for the grand entrance of Borchardt's Katz Moody super algebras. So um, as always, our variable tau we'll have a variable tau that takes values in the upper half plane and will frequently make use of the exponentiated version q. And the star of monstrous moonshine, as I'm sure most people in the audience know, is the modular j function j of tau, which is a modular function for SL2z. Uh, and I'll always denote its uh, expansion coefficients with respect to the Fourier expansion in the tau goes to i infinity limit as these c of n. So we'll see c of n uh, frequently throughout the talk. So um, of course, modular functions are meromorphic functions that are naturally defined on compact surfaces of the form h mod gamma, where gamma is a suitable discrete subgroup of SL2R 
compactified. And J is modular under SL2Z in particular. So here I've written down its invariance properties under the generators of SL2Z. And uh, SL2Z is an example of what are called genus zero groups, uh, which are so named uh, when this uh, quotient space compactified has the topology of a Riemann sphere, so hence genus zero. And precisely in the case uh, when the groups are genus zero, um, these, the modular groups admit a privileged generator of the field of um, modular functions with respect to that group. This doesn't happen when the quotient space uh, has higher genus. So uh, these generators are called normalized hopped modules. So the normalized just means that I scale the leading coefficient to one, and I'll also, also um, further uh, be throwing away the constant term. Normally you say normalized hopped module with vanishing constant term, but anyway. So J of tau isn't just a modular function under SL2Z. Uh, it's in particular, uh, with this normalization, the hopped module for the group. So it generates the field of modular functions for SL2Z, or in other words, all modular functions for a genus zero group are rational functions of the hopped module. Um, so uh, ratios of polynomials in J in, uh, in particular. Great. So the precipitating observation of monstrous moonshine uh, took this distinguished modular function and um, was related to the properties of its Fourier expansion. So here I've written the first few terms of the Fourier expansion in Q. And what was noticed by Mackay and later also by Thompson was that um, the Fourier coefficients of the J function have the unusual property that they can be decomposed into dimensions of irreducible representations of the monster group, which is the largest of the sporadic finite simple groups which is a very peculiar thing. So here I've written the first few decompositions of the first few Fourier coefficients in terms of their uh, uh, monster EREPs. And Mackay and Thompson proposed that this curious observation could at least be partly explained if the following, um, if the following structure existed. Namely, suppose there was an infinite dimensional graded monster module that historically is called V natural. So I'll always use V natural to denote such an object. And it's graded subspaces, I'll always denote by V sub N. So if you suppose there's such an infinite dimensional graded module, so the monster group is acting on V natural as automorphisms, well, first of all, then it's natural that the VNs, which are finite dimensional uh, spaces, will decompose as representations of the automorphism group, decompose as representations of M. And then, um, Assuming the existence of this V natural, you could then interpret the modular function J of tau as um, the graded uh, character of this module. So here I've rewritten the Fourier expansion of J and tau, where I've rewritten Cn, well, Cn would be the dimensions of the Vn, and I've, you can write that equivalently as the characters of the identity element of the monster in the corresponding representation Vn. And furthermore, if this V natural really exists, then it's also quite natural to generalize this and consider characters of arbitrary monster group elements, uh, chi G of Vn. And these functions are called the Mackay Thompson series. And the monstrous moonshine conjectures further concern very special properties of these Mackay Thompson series, including the J function. So, um, well, as you might expect, and as I sort of already uh, made clear in the introductory part of the talk, there does exist such an infinite dimensional Z graded module, it's called V natural. And indeed it has these twisted characters, T sub G. And this module is more than just a kind of a silly uh, graded vector space. It actually has the structure of a vertex operator algebra at central charge 24. So it's quite a rich structure. And it was constructed first by uh, Frankel, Lepowski and Merman. And uh, further, the module Monstrous moonshine conjectures are, uh, were posed by Conway and Norton. And the conjectures are some kind of surprising uh, extra structure on top of all of this already rich structure. The, the monstrous moonshine conjectures say that all of these Mackay Thompson series, not just the J function, are normalized hopped modules for genus zero groups, uh, subgroups of SL2R, which uh, is not uh, obvious from anything I've said. But of course, Borchard's 
proved the monstrous moonshine conjectures. And the key uh, player in his proof of the monstrous moonshine conjectures was a Borchard's Katz Moody algebra called the Monster Lee algebra with some very special properties. And so uh, that's where uh, we're going to turn next and introduce sort of the star uh, of the first part of the talk. So now we've come to the time where I can actually tell you at least roughly what a Borchard's Katz Moody algebra is. Sometimes these are called generalized Katz Moody algebras. At least I'll, I'll say what we need to know about them for this talk, even though hopefully I'll, I'll try to give a very broad and accessible overview so I won't uh, list a lot of formal definitions, um, but I'm happy to, to point out um, uh, more formal properties as necessary. So um, I assume most people in the audience are probably familiar with finite dimensional semi-simple Lie algebras, which have a lot of great structure and we understand the representation theory of those algebras to death. Um, and of course, what you can do, starting from the axioms of a finite dimensional semi-simple Lie algebra, is to try to progressively weaken the axioms uh, such that you still preserve a lot of nice structure um, and, and such that the resulting algebras are fairly tractable. And I'll, I'll make precise what I mean by that in a moment. So the first sort of natural generalization of a finite dimensional semi-simple Lie algebra is the Katz-Moody algebra, where in particular you allow infinite dimensionality of the algebra. And Borger's Katz-Moody algebras are just sort of the next natural weakening of some of these axioms one step beyond the Katz-Moody case. So in particular, they're often infinite dimensional, but nonetheless, they enjoy many of the properties of the finite dimensional case. So you should think of them as analogous to algebras that you're already, an analogous to Lie algebras that you might already be more familiar with. So in particular, uh, Borchardt's katz moody algebras are Lie algebras which still admit a nice triangular decomposition into positive and negative subalgebras and uh, abelian Lie algebras H. And the main novelty, um, the main difference uh, that a Borchardt's katz moody algebra has relative to the katz moody case is that you're allowed to have um, well, not just the simple roots are the generators of the algebra, and now they're allowed to be imaginary in the Borchardt's Katz Moody case, which means that the roots um, could have negative or zero norm in particular. So imaginary roots uh, might not be unfamiliar, but here they're allowed to be part of the generating set. And sort of all the sort of technical complications and the things that one needs to work carefully on with respect to Borchardt's Katz Moody algebras essentially comes from this relaxation of the definition. But as in the more familiar cases, to a, Bor a Borchardt's Katz Moody algebra can be associated to a Cartan matrix coming from the inner product of all the simple roots, satisfying various conditions, which I haven't written down, but will look very similar to the Katz Moody case. Um, these algebras also admit nice symmetric non degenerate bilinear forms. And given a Cartan satisfying these properties, you can define BKMs quite explicitly and concretely via chevalier ser generators and relations. Uh, again, very analogously to the ordinary Katz-Moody case. And indeed, of course, these will reduce to the Katz-Moody case if all the diagonal entries of the Cartan are positive. Um, but just as you should think of Katz-Moody algebras as essentially being a bunch of different SL2 subalgebras built up together in a particular prescribed way. So too, you should also think of Borchardt's Katz Moody algebras, but when you have roots in particular of zero norm, you're also allowed to have now three-dimensional Heisenberg algebras. And so Borchardt's Katz Moody algebras are some big structures that come from, again, these simple building blocks. But now you have Heisenbergs and SL2s built up in a prescribed way. Um, and there are various other useful alternative formalizations or characterizations of these structures. And um, I'll just refer to references for all the details of those things, but I don't think having them uh, on a slide would be particularly illuminating for us today. But I said that uh, these BKMs are nice because they're sort of the last bastion of general algebras that still enjoy like all the nice properties of the finite dimensional Lie algebra case that we really like. And what I mean by that in particular is that there's a nice highest weight theory for these BKMs. Um, and the piece of that that we'll use today is the following. Uh, in particular, there's a nice character formula for certain uh, integrable highest weight modules of BKMs. So this probably looks relatively familiar, at least if you like Katz-Moody algebras. Um, it's very similar to the ordinary Wildcats character formula. This is, of course, called the Wildcats Borchardt's character formula, um, where uh, we have some sum over wild group elements. But now there's some correction term in terms of imaginary simple roots that wasn't present in the Katz-Moody case. And I haven't defined it explicitly. I'm leaving it a bit implicit here. 
Uh, but otherwise, the rest of the structure of this formula probably looks very familiar to many of you. And uh, in the denominator, we have a product over uh, positive roots, depending on the multiplicity of these root spaces. Uh, BKMs also admit nice root space decompositions and where each um, subspace is finite dimensional and so on and so forth. And for today, all, we, all that we'll care about is to consider uh, the character of the trivial representation. So the left-hand side becomes equal to one and you can equate the numerator and denominator and obtain a formula like this. And this is the famous denominator identity of, in this case, a BKM. Of course, there are denominators for Katz Moody algebras too, um, from, from which you get nice things like Jacobi triple product identities and so on. Great, so the denominator identity is kind of going to be the starring structure in the BKMs that we're going to be interested in. Um, so I have some large class of algebras that I've, well, that Borchards has defined for us. Um, and there are constraints, you know, there, there are axioms that define these things, but in principle, this is still a huge class of algebras and it's not clear that all of them are particularly interesting or would be connected to other parts of mathematics. Um, the definitions are still fairly relaxed and they admit a huge number of admissible examples. But you can focus on a sort of subclass of BKMs that are a little bit inter more interesting in some sense. And one natural sort of subclass of BKMs that looks like it has a bit more structure are those where the denominators are actually automorphic. And all of the BKMs that we'll study today will have automorphic denominators and we'll see that in examples. And that harkens back to the beginning of the talk where I was, um, interested in understanding automorphic forms on string theoretic moduli spaces that were computing some BPS saturated quantity for me. Um, and of course, there are many uh, such BKMs that have been constructed abstractly from the carton um, of this type by these authors. And I should also say uh, for uh, later in the talk, and uh, as I already sort of hinted at earlier, BKMs can be super, just like Katz Moody algebras can be super. And a lot of the obvious generalizations just come into play here. Everything in sight becomes Z2 graded in an appropriate sense. The algebra now has a decomposition into even and odd subalgebras, which are mutually orthogonal with respect to the bilinear form, so on and so on. Um, and in addition to a denominator identity, a BKM superalgebra will also have a super denominator identity, which differs from the denominator identity by uh, signs uh, on the even and uh, relative signs on the even and odd parts, essentially. But it looks very similar to this guy. Great. So BKMs haunt string theory, or at least their denominator identities do. There are all kinds of computations of uh, quantities and supersymmetric theories like threshold corrections for which the answer, well, it's a nice automorphic object, which might be expected because I've said that duality, symmetry, you know, having dualities in string theory, which are ubiquitous, will produce as gadgets for you automorphic objects. But a lot of these automorphic objects are also apparently denominators for Borchardt's katz moody algebras. And if that's not just the, an automorphic coincidence, we would like to know what role the algebra structure itself is playing in these physical systems. Um, and uh, I, there's pioneering work of Harvey and Moore that has uh, illuminated some of these examples, uh, conjectured various roles for BKMs, um, uh, made explicit algebraic structures on BPS states and certain theories and so on and so forth. Um, but, but I think it's fair to say that there are still numerous mysteries at play about the connection between BKMs and string theory. Um, and in particular, one way to get BKMs, which will in particular always give BKMs that are interesting in the sense of having automorphic denominators, is to obtain them from uh, vertex operator superalgebras in a particular way, which was in fact how the monster Lie algebra uh, was, was constructed. So that's what we'll get to in, uh, in the next couple of slides. Um, but, so, but first, before going into the construction of the monster Lie algebra, I'd just like to introduce it to you and um, get you familiar with some of its properties. And then we'll move on to talk about the construction, which we uh, will generalize and use repeatedly in this talk. Can I leave the one? It, yeah. Um, from, from John Cuerta. Um, does the bilinear form always exist in, in the super BKM case? Um, always exist. Well, so uh, the super BKM is, yeah, it, it always exists, but it's rather than symmetric, it is super symmetric. So there is a bilinear form and it exists. Um, and there's a Z2 graded version of it in the super case. Uh, yeah. Uh, other questions? 
Okay. Great. So let us now um, come to the prototypical example of a BKM, everyone's favorite Borchardt's Cats Moody Algebra, or my favorite, I don't know. Do we have favorites? It's hard to play favorites. Uh, the Monsterly Algebra. So like I said, I'll defer the construction of the Monsterly Algebra to the next slide. Let me just sort of present it as a structure and give you some of its important properties. And in particular, why on earth one would be led to construct such a beast uh, in, if one is interested in the monstrous moonshine conjectures in particular. So the Monsterly Algebra is an infinite dimensional Lie Algebra of rank two and it's graded by the even unimodular lattice of signature one comma one, so two integers. So we label all the roots by a pair of integers m and n. And there's a bilinear form on this algebra, and in particular, the norm of the roots uh, of a root uh, with respect to this form looks like this. And of course, it admits a triangular decomposition. So here I've sort of split up a grid into positive, negative, and, and Carton uh, elements. And as a vector space here, I've just displayed the monster Lie algebra sort of as a grid indexed by M and N, just so you can have a sense of uh, at least the structure as a vector space. Uh, good, so we have, uh, and I'm working over C throughout this talk. Um, it doesn't matter so much for this example, but uh, for the supersymmetric cases, one, one should work over C, at least in the examples that I'm gonna be thinking about. Okay, so it's rank two, here's our, uh, Here's the zero, zero piece. And based on this norm here, we can see that this copy of C, this one dimensional vector space here is actually a real simple root because it, here it's, we have M equals minus one and N equals one. So the norm is positive. So it's a real root. And in particular, it's a simple root. And the other elements in this column, which are given uh, indexed by one comma N, well, you can see that the dimensionality of these vector spaces, of these graded subspaces, um, are exactly uh, Fourier coefficients of our old friend, the J function. Uh, more generally, uh, the multiplicity of these spaces, the root spaces of M comma N, are actually given by the coefficients of the J function with the argument M times N. Um, now, it turns out that this little four-dimensional vector space here actually generates a copy of GL2. So, so this relationship suggests that there should be a symmetry between M and N that just exchanges them. And in fact, the wild group of this monster Lie algebra is just inherited from the wild group of this copy of GL2 sitting here. It's just Z2, and the non-trivial element swaps the integers for you. Uh, so there really is such a symmetry, at least that's clear as a vector space. It's also true. Um, if you keep the more refined algebraic structures. And uh, th the key nice thing about this monster Lie algebra is going to be its denominator identity, as you might have already guessed. So the monster Lie algebra admits a very nice action of the monster group, which will be clear from its construction. And we'll come to that um, in the next slide. But for the moment, let me just present the denominator identity to you, since that's sort of the key character in, um, uh, in Borchardt's proof. So here we go, here's the denominator identity as I've written it. It's a beautiful identity involving the J function. Um, from the left-hand side, it's quite clear that this is automorphic because we have a, two copies of a modular function uh, under, uh, so we have a, it's automorphic with respect to SL2Z times SL2Z, quite clearly. And okay, you can ask, okay, how does one obtain the denominator identity from this algebra? Uh, for the mathematicians, uh, it's perhaps useful to think of the homological version of the denominator identity, where you have, where you look at the positive subalgebra, G plus, and you can consider exterior powers of, of G plus. Um, and you, when one should view this as an alternating sum, so there are signs uh, on, on every other term. And there's this identity for general Lie algebras that equates these uh, uh, exterior powers with the Lie algebra homology of G plus. Uh, so for the mathematicians, you can compute the right-hand side uh, essentially by constructing the usual chevalier eilenberg complex associated to G plus uh, valued in the trivial representation with the standard differential and take the hom uh, homology of that, of that complex. And you can compute these HIs explicitly. And so for the monster, there's only a few non-vanishing homology groups and I've just written them explicitly here in terms of these variables P and Q. Um, in particular, the elements, the non-zero, uh, or the, the things that contribute to the homology, 
say the homology group H sub I, are going to be these wedge I G pluses uh, such that the elements satisfy, the elements of weight gamma satisfy a relation like this. And if that looks mysterious, uh, it's not too important. This is just for, um, for experts that, that might be aware of these constructions already. And you can decategorify um, this relation to obtain the denominator identity by computing the Hilbert Poincaré series. Um, and in particular, a relationship like this, which has no mixed terms um, in P and Q or sigma and tau, um, we have no mixed terms on the left, but obviously what looks like a huge number of mixed terms on the right-hand side. And so having an identity like this implies an infinite number of relations on the coefficients of the J function. And this turn out, these turn out to be strong enough to imply that J is genus zero. And there's a notion of uh, replicable functions introduced, uh, or I, I believe it was introduced by Gannon, but I apologize, I forgot the citation here. So the denominator identity for this algebra uh, is, enables you to prove uh, that J is the hopped module for SL2Z. Uh, I see a number of questions in the chat. Maybe now is an okay time to pause, actually. Well, um, if you have been answered. Um, okay. I have last one from Greg, um, which is <laughs> just asking um, to clarify why, why, why these homology groups are, are relevant in this talk. In this talk. Um, if you don't like this um, appearance of the homology groups, you can perfectly well forget about them for this talk. Yeah, I, I think that's 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 all I need to say for that. If you if you're familiar with this categorification of denominator identities, then um, that's fine. For today, it's not too important if the homology groups look weird or unfamiliar. Okay. Uh, good, good to go? Yeah. Okay. Great. So that was the monster Lie algebra, but I haven't told you how it's constructed. And in particular, I told you that the monster Lie algebra carries a really nice action of the monster group that's actually useful for proving the remainder of the monster uh, monstrous moonshine conjectures. Not just useful, it was, it was essential in the proof of the monstrous moonshine conjectures. And that comes with what I uh, comes from what I alluded to earlier, which is that there's some kind of black box that takes as input a VOA or a super VOA and spits out a BKM or a super BKM for you. And this is a, a quote unquote string theory functor in a very loose sense. Um, now, if you uh, are not really a vertex algebra person and uh, don't really like any of the remaining things that I'm going to say on this slide, then all you need to know from this slide is that as a representation of a monster group, this construction tells you that the mo uh, monster Lie algebra at in the degree m comma n subspace is isomorphic to V natural with um, grading m time uh, in the graded space m times n. So that is what this construction will do for you. Uh, and if you uh, if all the properties of the uh, rest of the construction look ugly, then this is all you have to remember for today. So whatever this construction is, it looks very much like some kind of chiral or holomorphic simulacrum of what a physicist would want to do in constructing a bosonic string theory. Now, it's not really what a physicist want to do because as I said, if I was building some string theory, some string compactification, maybe based on some sigma model with target a Calabi out or whatever, whatever I like to do, I don't have a neat splitting uh, of uh, the world sheet conformal field theory or super conformal field theory into a holomorphic times an anti-holomorphic bit. They're mixed up together in complicated ways. But if I am allowed myself uh, to sort of abstract away from the physics, and if I just wanted to work with a holomorphic vertex operator algebra structure, which is a very concrete mathematical thing, then uh, formally I would do something like, uh, like the following steps. And this is exactly what Borchards did in a rigorous way. But um, that's why I call it sort of a string theory functor in quotes. It, it looks like a kind of a shadow cousin, a, a, a poor piece of, of a full string theory construction. Um, so, uh, and in particular, its output spits out exactly this relationship for us, which is really the, the key feature of the monster Lie algebra for our purposes. Uh, so what one does, uh, and I'll, I'll be brief, 
through these steps because if you've never seen this construction before, it will look quite mysterious. And for the string theorists in the audience, uh, it will look like a chiral version of something that's already quite familiar to you that you might remember from your grad school days. Um, so I'll be uh, very sketchy about this and, and beg your indulgence. And uh, if, if you want more details, I'm happy to provide more later. And of course, the papers are full of gory details about these kinds of constructions. The idea is to start with your vertex operator algebra of interest. Of course, in this context, we're going to start with the natural. We tensor in a vertex algebra based on the even unimodular lattice of signature 1, 1. So this is now some theory with central charge 26, a, a vertex algebra of central charge 26. And then one would like to impose a condition, which is called the physical state condition, that restricts to states in this tensor product theory of conformal weight 1. Um, I won't explain today why you want to do this, but let's assume it's something you want to do. In particular, it results in, again in exactly these nice subspaces. And if you're trying to impose a constraint on some wacky system, it often behooves you to work cohomologically and impose the constraint that way. And indeed, there's a semi-infinite cohomology procedure that one can do to restrict to this physical state condition that physicists call the BRST cohomology, which involves tensoring in an additional vertex algebra based on the so-called BC ghost system, which imposes the constraint for you uh, when you take the cohomology with respect to a certain nilbidant uh, operator, which we call the BRST charge. And the space of physical states when you do this semi-infinite cohomology um, is exactly the space of interest uh, for, for, um, uh, for our purposes. And in particular, one makes use of the so-called no ghost theorem, which tells you that you really land on this kind of graded sub, these graded subspaces on the nose, the uh, excitations of the ghost decouple and kind of ex excitations from this piece also decouple. Um, so, and so this first appeared in physics and, and Borchards used it and formalized these ingredients in constructing the monsterly algebra. So the moral of the story is that we've done some procedure to, to obtain a space of quote unquote physical states, and you can prove that this space of physical states can be endowed with a natural Lie algebra structure, and it's exactly a BKM, and the resulting thing is the monster Lie algebra. But because from this construction, the monster Lie algebra has a natural monster action that's just staring us right in the face, we can now consider G equivariant versions of this denominator identity. And if we were Borchards, we can go ahead and prove that they're all hopped modules for genus zero groups. Um, and I should also say that this kind of string theory functor-like construction has been applied to other VOAs. Um, for example, the vertex operator algebra based on the leech lattice and also um, various orbifolds of the monster module um, constructed by Carnahan in his proofs of the generalized moonshine conjectures. So this, uh, this way of constructing BKMs can be applied to other cases, uh, even though the monster is sort of of historical interest for us. Okay. So we have this technology now. And if you have a machine or if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail and maybe you want to start producing BKMs like crazy. Um, now that's not necessarily the most well motivated thing to do, but let's just say that we want to construct some new examples. And so we need some interesting VOA or super VOA inputs. And indeed three natural um, such candidate VOAs suggest themselves. And there are classification theorems that actually tell us that these are roughly speaking the only uh, interesting three of a certain type that we might wanna study. I'll be vague about that. But we'll turn our attention to vertex operator super algebras of central charge 12. So here are the three main candidates. We have another uh, moonshine module, of, uh, moonshine module for Conway's largest group, which was studied uh, extensively by Duncan, VF natural. You can also consider a vertex operator algebra based on the E8 lattice VOA plus super partners. So, so far when I say super, I just mean that I have bosons and fermions. Uh, I, I mean super in the mathematical sense. Shortly, I will explain that I also want them to be super in a physics sense and I'll explain the distinction in a second. So we also have this VF8, and then there's a third candidate, which is the theory of just 24 free chiral fermions that I called lambda. Um, great. So for a physicist, I, for the physicists in the audience, I would say uh, these are the quote unquote NS sectors of a vertex operator algebra. One should also consider the Ramon sectors, um, which for the mathematicians should be viewed as the canonically twisted modules with respect to a fermion parity operation that acts as minus one on the odd subalgebra and zero on the even subalgebra. But I won't be very explicit about the details in the notation in this talk, just have in mind that uh, 
I'm being a little bit loose with the language. So um, in addition to having, in addition to these VOAs being super in the sense of they also have fermions, um, I want more to be true. In particular, I want them to admit representations of uh, the super conformal algebra. So VOAs are uh, representations of the conformal algebra, in this case of central charge 12, but I can also make a choice of um, a field called the supercurrent that satisfy the OPEs, satisfies OPEs with the stress energy tensor such that I get a genuine super conformal algebra. So for the rest of the talk, when I say super VOAs, I'll also mean that I'm, I've made a choice of supercurrent explicit for these algebras and I'm viewing them as representations of the super conformal algebra. And these guys, turn out to admit up to automorphisms, unique choices of such a supercurrent. And this, uh, this VOA turns out to admit eight admissible choices. And I'll come back to that later. So here I'm actually going to get um, a family of examples from a priori this one, one type of theory. So what do you do? You take these VOAs, you plug them into your string theory functor and you spit out a super BKM. This was originally done for the VFE8 case by Scheitauer, and he laid down the formalism for what the quote unquote string theory functor means in the supersymmetric case, and all the extra bells and whistles that you need relative to Borchardt's examples to construct a super BKM. And following Scheitauer's work, we, we did the same thing with the Conway module, and also with F24, with all of its choices of supercurrents, which yields at the end of the day, eight different examples. Okay, that's great. Now, as I said, um, it's always nice to produce more examples of things, especially when you have particularly natural structures like moonshine modules in the game. But I also just want to briefly mention, although not explain, that these super VOAs at central charge 12 have been lurking in the background of a host of other interesting string theoretic developments. I don't have time to explain any of them. Um, and so the best I can offer at the moment is a list of references uh, outlining some interesting connections between these super VOAs and other uh, interesting stringy developments. And uh, that's just to say that as always, we have a little bit more in the back of our mind than just producing new algebras. Um, but nonetheless, unfortunately, I don't have time uh, to, to explain all of these uh, wonderful works today. Okay, so yeah. Um, also from Greg, um, F24 means uh, 24 Majorana vial fermions. Yep. Great. Other, any other questions? Okay. Have a time. Okay. So, as I said, we can turn the crank and produce soup, Borchard's, super, uh, Borchard's Katz Moody super algebras. Let me not go through the super symmetric embellishments that one needs to do in the super case. Again, for the physicists, a lot of these kinds of ingredients will be familiar if you just imagine restricting yourself to some chiral version of things. You need super ghosts. In particular, you can take, you have graded traces over the VOA and it's canonically twisted module. And you can also take super traces of each of these where um, super trace means you insert that fermion parity operator that counts things with sign uh, with respect to the even and odd parts. And you have to treat all of these functions together. And uh, for, for physicists, uh, I'll say you have to include a GSO projection and various other things. But um, at the end of the day, we produce um, a new Borchardt's Katz Moody super algebra uh, with a natural Conway group action that looks completely analogous to what we had in the monster case. And we have denominator identities for the structure, of course, as well as super denominator identities. And because the Conway, uh, because this construction is completely functorial, my Conway action comes along for the ride and I have G equivariant versions of all of these functions as well. And um, I believe this should provide uh, an alternate proof of the genus zero property for Conway moonshine, although we didn't actually uh, explore it in that context. Um, I should just say that, I mean, historically, this would be the natural thing to do if you wanted to prove uh, the genus zero property for the Conway moonshine, mo moonshine module. This is totally analogous to what Borchardt did in the monster case, but it turns out that in the Conway case, you actually don't need to do that to prove genus zero for the functions. Um, because there's a lot of coincidences with, with monster functions and so on and so forth. Um, but any, anyway, I think this is a, a, fills a bit of a conceptual gap in the moonshine story, which I won't, uh, won't say more about today, but if you're interested, we can talk more later. 
Okay, so that's one super BKM. Here's eight more. Um, as I said, F24 admits eight natural choices of this n equals one supercurrent. You can construct them by looking at certain ordered products of the fermions lambda. Um, they're allowed to have some anti-symmetric coefficients. And in particular, um, this putative supercurrent, uh, if, if it is to have the right OPEs with the stress energy tensor, um, it imposes restrictions on what these constants Cijk can be. In particular, it's uh, pretty straightforward to show that these have to be structure constants for any semi-simple Lie algebra of dimension 24, but arbitrary rank. And there are eight such examples of that. So here, here are the eight possibilities. And we, with those eight choices of supercurrent, we turn up the same crank and get eight new examples. Um, and these are, these are quite nice examples that all of the super BKMs we find here admit uh, nice Katz Moody subalgebras G hat, depending on the choice of supercurrent. Um, the rank also depends on the choice of G, uh, which affects the, the root space grading of these algebras. They're still infinite dimensional, of course, um, but there's a host, host of functions that you get. So again, can derive the denominators and get the super denominators for these algebras. Okay, that is all purely formal. So now I'm going to turn uh, in the last 10 minutes to say a little bit about uh, the physics of low dimensional string comp compactifications and how these structures actually appear in the models that we study and how they act on BPS states in our physical string theories. Okay, so that was all purely formal. And since I'm about to go on to um, sort of the last part of the talk, maybe now is a good time to pause for questions. Um, so there is a question from Jeff Harvey, which you might answer in the last part of your talk, uh, whether the SEF24 model is embedded in, embedded in a critical string or super string theory. Uh, good, yeah, that will that will come up again uh, towards the end of the talk. I think my last uh, last slide. The short answer is that um, yeah, there is a natural uh, there are some natural type two string theory examples where F twenty four can be naturally embedded, and uh, we're working on studying those. In in the paper that appeared on the archive last week. Um, we constructed these super BKMs for F24 and the work that will hopefully appear maybe this month or next month will really embed F24 and the other super VOA examples in string theory. Any other questions? There, there is one um, sort of tangential question whether the um, that 24 is related to the periodicity of, of TMF. That's a great question. Uh, maybe, uh, I, maybe I, maybe I, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 that, sorry. I'm just letting you know who it was from. Yeah, uh, who is it from? Hank Chen. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. There are people that can better answer that question than I can. And at the moment, I think I could only say something a little bit speculative, but I expect the answer is known to experts, but I will not say anything about it for the moment. Um, but let me, since that question was asked, let me highlight um, that uh, the Conway module appears in some recent work implicating TMF uh, by, by Johnson Fried. But let me not say anything about F24. Any other questions? Uh, no, thanks. Okay. Okay, so we have these VOAs and superways. Let's do what I advertised at the beginning of the talk and put them into a low dimensional string construction. And, um, well, let me start with the first, uh, the first obvious example that uh, we originally studied in some older work with Person and Volpato. And as I said, I want to study string theory world sheets that are nicely factorized. So these are not generic string compactifications, but they're special examples glued together from these nice building blocks. And the basic idea is that, so all everything that I did with this string theory functor, it was manifestly chiral, holomorphic, and so on and so on. And a full string theory construction is not going to be nicely holomorphic or chiral. But nonetheless, the idea is that for these special factorized examples, if I further restrict my attention to BPS states, I'm essentially able to make some statements um, that are quite analogous to the holomorphic case. And there's subspaces of states in these theories that behave sort of like holomorphic structures. And in particular, we can see the action of the BKM very concretely. So that's uh, the main message for this part of the talk, if everything else gets lost in the details. 
So here's a, my quote unquote compactification theory or the internal part. It's a product of the natural with the Conway module, uh, the anti-holomorphic version of the Conway module. And I'm going down to two space-time dimensions where let's take uh, in this example, um, the spatial dimension compactified on a circle of radius r. And then we do what we usually do in super string theory. We build up the space of physical states and, and you know, we, we do all the hard work. I'll repress all of the details, but again, you should think of it for the mathematicians. It, I had this funny functor and now I'm doing something rather analogous to it, but instead of having nice holomorphic things to work with, I have holomorphic and anti-holomorphic dependence everywhere in the game and things just become a little bit more, more intricate and messy. In particular, uh, what I want to emphasize for today is that if I have um, a single string winding around this circle of radius r, it has some left and right moving momenta that I'm calling k and k bar. And uh, these momenta depend on, or yeah, they depend on two quantum numbers for the string that I call the momentum and winding quantum numbers. So it, the way I've written it, m and n are integers. And there's also dependence on the radius of the circle r. And the momentum squared, although I might be off by a sign here, but nonetheless, the uh, momentum squared for the string traveling on this spatial circle has um, a pretty familiar inner product from what we saw earlier. Uh, good. And indeed, the momenta take values in one of our familiar lattices. So this is probably priming you for the appearance of the monster Lie algebra. In this model, I want to restrict to BPS states, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. So in this two-dimensional space-time, there's a super algebra generated by some odd generators Q. And uh, they obey a relationship like this. And I want to focus on states whose eigenvalues under the Hamiltonian, or the energy eigenvalues, are equal to the right moving momenta. So the BPS states are special states in a super string theory, such that the right hand side is zero. And the eigenvalue of, of this operator P bar is just K, K bar that I've written here. So BPS states are states whose energy is given by a formula like this. And it's graded by these two integers m and n, and it depends on the radius. Um, now, one can show explicitly that if I focus on the BPS states of this theory, it turns out that the monster Lie algebra acts linearly on these states. And the BPS states transform in the adjoint representation of the algebra. In the interest of time, I won't go through exactly how that arises. Um, a little bit more precisely, I can't completely get rid of the purely the anti-holomorphic dependence that's coming along here, but it turns out that um, having this extra right moving stuff in the game actually only gives me an extra degeneracy here. So really there's 24 copies of the adjoint representation of G, but it's, it's a very sort of mild remnant of anti-holomorphic dependence in this case. So things still behave quite nicely. In particular, the monster Lie algebra is generated by some BRST exact states in string theory, which physicists recognize as exactly the sort of states in a string theory that produce a gauge symmetry. Um, but for the physicists, it looks like this gauge symmetry is actually spontaneously broken because the gauge symmetries are generated by um, the BRST exact states with momentum squared equal to zero. But here, as it turns out, all of the states have non-zero momentum. So it looks like some kind of broken algebra that is generating the spectrum of BPS states in this model. And in general, one can start building up a math physics dictionary between all the stuff that Borchards did and the various corresponding ingredients in the string compactification. Um, all I want to emphasize in this table is that, for example, if I focused on the positive subalgebra of the monster Lie algebra, that's in correspondence with focusing on BPS states of positive energy, which depends on the radius of the circle. So states where the energy, again, is greater than zero. And I could consider also, remember these exterior powers of G+, plus, which can help me realize the denominator identity from the homological point of view. So um, this gives the, the left-hand side of the denominator identity, and I'll, I'll skip sort of the appearance of the right-hand side for the moment. So wedge G plus can be realized not just by considering a single string in this theory, but actually uh, many such strings and constructing a Fox space uh, of positive energy BPS states uh, that I mentioned before. And this is another concrete representation of the monster Lie algebra. I can prove that it's a nice representation if I allow for an arbitrary number of fundamental strings and computing a supersymmetric index of the BPS states in this 
kind of second quantized picture reproduces the denominator identity for me. So a BPS index gives the while a denominator in this model. Um, and I'll just mention, since I'm essentially out of time, that in the work to appear soon, we do a very similar kind of construction for the super VOAs that we met earlier, tensoring in one choice on the left, one choice on the right. So these could this could be VF natural, it could be F24, and so on and so forth. And because there are many different choices, again, things become more complicated and, and they depend on which choice of the models that we're making. And since I don't have time, I won't say anything more about these type two models, other than, for example, if I chose both of these to be copies of VF natural, that Conway module, I could do a path integral computation to compute a version of a BPS index in these theories. And I can reobtain the denominator or super denominator identities for the Conway Lie algebra that we constructed earlier in the talk. So we expect that things will work in a very similar way, although there is going to be much to sort out. And I'll, I'll just uh, let that serve as an advertisement for work to appear hopefully very soon. Okay, so since I'm essentially out of time, I'll just summarize and conclude uh, and now wrap up. So the summary of what I've, uh, what I've uh, just explained is that it's instructive to study string compactifications down to these low numbers of non-compact dimensions. And it's particularly helpful to get a mathematical handle on some of uh, the algebraic structures that we're interested in um, to study these factorized internal uh, string theories given by products of super VOAs. Uh, when they're moonshine modules, you can further start to examine special properties of the automorphic denominators. Um, although I haven't, uh, I won't say more about that in this talk. But again, happy to talk more offline about those aspects of the story. Uh, but in particular, the BPS states in these models seem to form concrete representations of super Borchardt's Katz Moody algebras that we construct. For a single string, we get copies of the adjoint, at least in the monster case. And again, it's seeming, seeming to be essentially true in the type two case as well. And when we look at many such strings, we, uh, they form uh, the representation wedge D plus. We've also just formally constructed new examples of super BKMs with their corresponding denominator identities and um, work to appear. We'll again realize these in low dimensional string compactifications and hopefully produce new useful examples of, of this kind of story and structure. There's a lot more to be done. Um, one thing I would really like to understand is for example, how D brains could behave in these models. I think that would be instructive. And it would also be useful to further explore the webs of dualities in these theories. I talked a little bit about dualities and studying, um, studying how BKMs at different cusps are related to one another by the action of dualities. There's a rich story there, uh, which I've mostly suppressed, but uh, is partly understood. Uh, but at the same time, there are other kinds of dualities like string string dualities. And it would be very interesting to know if, for example, there's a duality that takes the heterotic monster model to some kind of type two dual. Uh, so that's an open question. But more generally, understanding the duality webs more explicitly, I think, is worth doing, particularly in the type two models, which we're still working out. And finally, there's lots uh, more interesting stuff that I haven't had time to talk about. Um, and in the interest of time, maybe I'll only mention one of, of the interesting directions, which is that a lot of the story should have an interesting connection to enumerative geometry, in particular to gromov witten theory. It's familiar to probably some people in the audience, at least I I at least know that there's one person in the audience with that this would be familiar to. I haven't looked at the participant list, um, but there are certain automorphic forms that seem to be governing some interesting gromov witten theory. For example, if one studies the product of K3 in an elliptic curve, um, this automorphic form is the inverse of a denominator of a BKM. And does that BKM play any role in organizing the enumerative geometry of a product of K3 times an elliptic curve? More generally, what can we understand about enumerative geometry by the BKM examples that we've been studying? And even more ambitiously, I want to understand this whole story better for more general moduli spaces. You know, I've talked about automorphic forms, which are typically defined on, uh, uh, on spaces that can be realized as quotients of symmetric spaces based on the orthogonal group of signature two comma N. At least that's where Borchard's gave us nice product representations for these kinds of automorphic uh, forms. But string theory moduli spaces in general, well, even in nice cases, they can be symmetric spaces based on orthogonal groups of more general signature. And then Calabi-Yau moduli spaces are more complicated and intricate still. 
And it would be great to understand what general lessons we can draw about the interplay between the automorphic forms defined on these more general moduli spaces, BPS indices in the theory, the corresponding algebraic structures, and, um, and how all of these pieces fit together when we lose some of the, the nice product formulas or denominator identities that we've really been leveraging in, uh, in our work so far. So that is all I want to say. Thank you everyone for your attention and stay well. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, there were a few leftover questions from the chat and I'm just going to ask um, these participants one by one to, to just ask them. Um, and if anyone else has a question, please go ahead and raise your hand. Um, so there is a question from Lisa Carbone. Um, thanks, Tudor, and thanks, Natalie, for a really wonderful talk. Um, the monsterly algebra actually got a different grade and it was proven by Elizabeth Jurisic. Um, it's um, a GL2, um, direct sum, positive and negative freely algebras. Yes. It's generated by countably many imaginary root vectors. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if you've ever explored the physical interpretation of the freely algebras. Oh, of the freely algebras. So they, should, they should act as some sort of shift or, um, you know, some sort of transformation of infinite order. I see. Um, I'd be very interested in discussing it offline. Um, sure. Yeah, I, I was trying to quickly see if um, that was implicit in anything that we have explored but perhaps it's better to, to think a little bit more carefully offline. I agree that in everything I've said, the GL2 was leveraged, in particular, the wild group provided the Z2, which is an interesting algebra automorphism that we did use um, in our physical theory, but I have not thought so much about the, uh, maybe, maybe enough about the ramifications of the big free part. Um, also there's, um, you can ex naturally extend the VAR group by an imaginary reflection and, um... Oh, um, by uh, imaginary with by reflections with respect to all of the imaginary simples uh, indexed by one comma n. There's there's one imaginary reflection which preserves the whole root system, and um, perhaps it's again the sort of thing to discuss offline. Yeah, um, yeah, that sounds very interesting. I'd like to hear more about that. Um, okay. I'm not certain if if I was aware of that in in another context. That sounds very interesting. Um, it's, it's not in the literature so far. Ah, okay, then I certainly wouldn't be aware of it. Yeah, I'd be very happy to talk more about that offline. Thanks, uh, thanks again for a wonderful talk. Thanks very much. Um, next there is a, uh, thanks very much, Lisa. Ne next there is a question by Raius Lergat. Raius. Um, hi, Natalie, thanks for your talk. Uh, hi. I just wondered about something on your penultimate slide. Uh, you invoked uh, the kind of modular integrals that Harvey and Moore studied in the N equals two heterotic string compactifications for threshold corrections, but you're in a type two context. So I first want you to check, I assume you're invoking some kind of type two heterotic duality. So on this slide here, I'm working within the type two string already. Um, but indeed, so Harvey Moore and Borchards um, gave us a prescription for computing certain divergent integrals of a particular form uh, where you have some some modular form with a theta function kernel, and you're integrating over uh, a string world sheet or, or a T2. Right. And um, the path integrals that arise, even in these low dimensional compactifications, even though we're not doing a 4D and equals two computations, those same integrals appear here in the BPS indices. And so we can leverage that technology and produce automorphic BPS indices here. I understand. So I suppose implicitly my question is, do you have a direct do you or does anyone have a direct type two interpretation of that modular integral? So like on the one hand, we can say it's a threshold correction uh, like of a gravitational nature in a heterotic string, but on the type two side, do we have like a direct interpretation? How, how would we derive this integral from first principles? Um, you can, so there's a few things that you can do. So, so first of all, this, these kinds of theta lifts appear in our type two string construction, uh, but, but also one can do a path integral computation in the heterotic monster case as well. So in the heterotic and the type two string, there's a certain BP, there's a certain index problem that one can set up 
that roughly speaking is going to count BPS states in these models. And one can compute this thing in a Hamiltonian formalism, but you can also compute the same quantity in a path integral formalism in either the heterotic string or the type two string, um, even in these low dimensional models. And that path integral naturally produces um, an integral of the form of a Harvey Moore Borchard's uh, theta lift type integral, which is, so uh, the path integral uh, from a physical point of view is manifestly duality invariant and Correspondingly, um, when one does the integral, one manifestly obtains an automorphic answer. I, I hope that that answer. Yeah. If that, is that written up in, in your guys' work that you're citing here? Yes. Uh, so this paper hasn't appeared yet, but um, if you if you like automorphic integrals, they appear in all of the other works that have appeared, and of course, uh, in the original original right, Harvey right. Moore Borchardt's work. I suppose I'm just really looking for a, a direct interpretation of, of the how, how transform or theta lift from the type two perspective. Yeah, um, that appears in the paper and, uh, well, and perhaps I'm not sure how much more of an interpretation you want in real time, but I'm happy to explain in more detail how it, how it appears. I mean, it really comes from a physical computation um, of computing certain partition functions on the string world sheet. Yeah, I'm, and and as I said, it's the the BPSness sort of allows you to get things that look holomorphic, even though we're in a full physical string. If that helps a little bit. No, it does. There's a tag question by uh, Greg Moore. Um, do you want to ask anything out loud, Greg? Um, Hi, Natalie. So, yeah. so. Oh, but this is not actually, this can't be interpreted as a term in the effective action, right? I mean, in these you know, examples, I know I don't. In the previous examples, uh, you know, you, you're, you're calculating one loop corrections to the pre yeah. or F1 and so on. Yeah, quite right. Yeah, but thanks for emphasizing you're that. You're sort of, you're, you're just looking at a, a partition function of the 2D world sheet theory. Uh, space-time. It's a space-time partition. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Of the space-time theory. So you're on a space-time T2? Yes. Okay. So you're defining a, a partition function on, on the space-time T2. Yes. And then that leads to this kind of modular integral? Correct. I see. Yeah. And, and thanks for that question. I, that, I should have emphasized that uh, more in the talk. Thanks, Greg. Also, thanks for, for clarifying that. Um, and uh, finally, there's a question by John Huerta. Hi, Natalie. Thanks for the talk. Hi, John. Hi. Um, you mentioned, I think you mentioned something like a asymmetric T8 orbifold. Yes. Could you tell us more about what that is? Yes. Um, well, this was a parenthetical, I would say, for the for the string theorist that doesn't like to look at these factorized VOAs. Um, what you can so one way to obtain a theory like this is um, so one can imagine starting from a string compactification on T eight down to two dimensions, and there are very special points in the moduli space if you tune the metric in the B field where the internal CFT will factorize. Of course, it doesn't, but as I said, there are special points in the moduli space. Uh, where you can achieve a factorization like this. And um, further, one can obtain these particular modules on the left and right by sitting at that special point and then where, where you have factorization and then orbifolding the stuff on the left and orbifolding the stuff on the right separately, which string theorists call an asymmetric orbifold. Um, and, and there are, you know, of course, numerous consistency conditions such a thing has to satisfy to be a good string theory and so on and so forth. But it's just if you're uncomfortable with having products of VOAs, you can sort of start to uh, approach this model, you know, uh, geometrically. But the asymmetric orbifold operation is non geometric. So. Okay, thanks. Um, and uh, Sherrier? Um, you had a question as well. Hi. Yeah. Uh, thank you. It's um, uh, it's a very simple. Well, it's a, a naive question, I guess. 
Um, I was just wondering if in these denominator things, these uh, J sigma and J tau, Js are, just to clarify, are modular, are hop modules on some, um, so then there, there's a beautiful uh, formula called the gross zage formula for the difference of these functions, where uh, the sigma and tau are Hegener points of uh, the same discriminant. Yeah, where the sigma and tau are uh, yes. Hegener points. Yeah. That's a wonderful story. I wish I had a physical interpretation of that formula. That would be that would be excellent. Um, perhaps some of the distinguished members of the audience have thought about this. I it's kind of a dream of mine to understand that uh, formula physically. I have no idea how. I see. And um, I just wanted to clarify it for myself. So, is it possible to go to the slide uh, just before you introduce the BKMs, please? This one? Yes. So, uh, I, I just wanted to make sure. And so, in the conjecture, all um, so in the conjecture, gamma G is an arithmetic group. It's a subgroup of SL2Z in particular? No. Uh, and that's one of the. Uh, beautiful and important features of uh, monstrous moonshine. These gamma Gs are discrete subgroups of SL2R, but they may lie outside of SL2Z. Uh, but sometimes they might, well, in you gave a few examples where they are lying in uh, their subgroups of SL2Z. Right. Is it in moon, particular, is it J is, uh, J is uh, modular for SL2Z. Right. So but yes, it's um, important that these have elements that lie outside of SL2Z. In general. Natalie, could you could you tell us a little bit about how they you know how you do that Atkin Laner and all that? Oh, um, how how in our uh, uh, in our I mean, two dimensional not, not way outside SL two Z. Ah, yes. So you want me? I maybe. You're, so here's the simplest example of such a transformation that might lie outside of SL two Z, but that is present in these zero, genus zero groups. You might have a transformation that takes tau to minus one over n tau, where n is the order of uh, a group element G that you're considering. That's called a Fricke involution, and those Fricke involutions, uh, in particular, extend some of these groups outside of SL two Z. Right, so they're all congruent subgroups. Uh, they're of, uh, so they're not all of the type gamma naught n. No, they're not. In okay, particular, you might have you might have a uh, gamma naught n as the part that's a subgroup of SL two Z, but then you then it gets extended by something like a Fricke involution tau right. goes to minus one over n tau. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so they're, they're definitely bigger than congruent subgroups. And all the ones that are arithmetic, are they known? Because the number of Gs are, okay, they're huge, but there's uh, finitely many Gs. So is it yeah, known? all of, all of these groups are known. And in particular, these are actually class functions. So you only have to worry about the number of conjugacy classes of the monster, and that's 194. There's 194 of those, as opposed to the 10 to the 54 elements of the monster group, which would have been... Uh, formidable indeed yeah okay but yes these groups are all known all known and of course the corresponding genus of the riemann surface as well I mean, H well they're, they're all genus zero yeah that's okay cool <laughs> let me ask if uh there are any other questions um let me know and raise your hand Otherwise, um, let's all thank Natalie again um, for, for that engaging and encompassing talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natalie. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank Hope you. to see you all soon in person.